Howdy folks, my name is Jerry, and this is a tutorial for the Grumman E-1B Tracer. Uh, it is itself a derivative of the C-1A Trader, which is a derivative of the S-2 Tracker. And I've made both those uh, aircraft already, and there is a video tutorial uh, available for them. Uh, and this aircraft has uh, quite a few similarities uh, with those other two. Uh, but uh, this aircraft was built late in the design cycle, so there are a few systems in the cockpit that have changed and have been moved around. Uh, we'll go over those briefly, but the vast majority of this tutorial is going to be on the radar, its operation, and uh, some of the idiosyncrasies surrounding it. So let's hop aboard and get going. All right, so we're here in the cockpit, and like I mentioned, uh, some of the systems have been changed uh, as this aircraft was developed late in the uh, design cycle of the aircraft. So uh, I have followed the nav air manuals for this aircraft like I did the previous two. So the layout and names of uh, some of the switches and dials have changed, and we'll go over those now. Uh, first and foremost, you'll remember that the electrical panel on the tracker and trader were located here. It's now been moved over the co-pilot's uh, seat, and, or on the overhead over the co-pilot's seat. And the battery switch is now called a DC bus die. It's the same thing, serves the same purpose, uh, it's just a name change. The, as you'll also remember, the trader and tracker, uh, the, only the port or left engine uh, provided uh, AC current. Uh, the tracer, both engines have AC generators that you can uh, engage and then connect to the electrical system with the AC bus tie. So in that regard, uh, that's something to be mindful of uh, when you're on the ground. They do have a load meter here. We'll go over that a little more later, uh, but if you have a high load, uh, having both AC generators on will reduce that load uh, on the uh, electrical system. Moving over to the uh, over the pilot's head on the overhead, uh, the air conditioning control is over here now. The stall warning test is located here, and what was called the rudder assist is now called a rudder boost. Uh, again, same purpose. Uh, it needs to have the hydraulic system on uh, for it to function. Uh, over the co-pilot's head, there is a uh, left and right. Uh, these were called auxiliary fuel pumps on the tracker and trader. Now they're called boost pumps. Again, same purpose. They do provide some cooling uh, and, of course, priming of the fuel lines, and uh, but do uh, draw quite a bit of electricity while if the engines are off. If we move down to the center console here, uh, you'll see the uh, autopilot, which is called the Automatic Flight Control System, or AFCS. It can be disengaged uh, from the number two hotkey that you can see on the HUD there from either the pilot or the co-pilot seat. This is the uh, master switch for the system. You need to have that on if you wish to uh, be holding a pitch, uh, which was discussed in the previous tutorial. There is also an altitude hold that works exactly the same as the one on the tracker. But there's also now a heading hold. Uh, if you have a, are flying a given heading that you uh, would like to, you can turn this switch on. This yellow light will illuminate. And as long as you don't make any rudder or aileron inputs, it will hold that heading to the best of its ability. Uh, if you have all three of these switches on and then press the two uh, number two hotkey, the disengage switch, you'll hear an alarm. The heading light will dis uh, extinguish and you'll have con complete control of the aircraft. Uh, however, the switches will remain on and you will need to cycle them off and then on again if you wish to use that system. Over the pilot's uh, head, I'm going to pop out of the seat here so you can see it a little better. Over his head here, there is a HF antenna uh, or winch. Uh, this aircraft, because of the radome, I uh, couldn't run uh, the radar and, or radio, radio antennas uh, from the tail down to the uh, top of the fuselage. So what they did is they had a trailing uh, wire antenna so that they could run out the back of the aircraft and uh, use that uh, for transmission transmitting. Uh, if you have it retracted, which I recommend doing when you're taking off or landing, uh, your radar, radio uh, range will be reduced uh, down to, I believe it's 4,000 meters. If you have it extended or uh, trailing, uh, you'll have uh, 10,000 meters of range with your HF radio. The uh, VHF radio remains the same. Uh, it's line of sight. You can use that to 10,000 meters. There's also uh, now a, 
a fuel dump system. This aircraft carries about a third, a little over a third more fuel uh, than the Trader and the Tracer, uh, Tracker, excuse me. So uh, that was intended mostly for the purposes of low speed loitering when it was flying uh, in and around the battle group. So if you have to make an emergency landing, you'll be carrying quite a bit of fuel and you can flick this switch on and it'll dump all of the remaining fuel in the tanks down to 2,000 pounds uh, remaining fuel. So you can turn it on and forget it. It, uh, it will shut itself off uh, once it reaches 2,000 pounds in each tank. However, I would recommend that if you intend to refuel the aircraft, you turn it off. There's a light located with it. If it is dumping fuel, this light will be illuminated. Uh, that include, concludes all of the changes on the cockpit uh, versus the uh, Trader and Tracer. We'll now move uh, into the uh, radar operators compartment and discuss those systems. All right, so we're here in the radar operators portion of the aircraft. On the left is the number one operator. On the right is the number two. Uh, there's a few things that we need to accomplish uh, back here before we begin moving the aircraft. So we'll go over those now. First thing we need to do is we need to make sure that we have uh, some DC power back here. So we're going to turn on the DC bus tie. And then we're going to turn on in the line uh, the position indicator. Uh, this takes about two minutes to go through its alignment process. Uh, and it will provide a uh, X and Y axis uh, coordinates, same as that's on the map, uh, that you can use uh, while in flight. If you uh, begin moving the aircraft before it's finished its alignment process, uh, it won't work, and you'll have to stop the aircraft, reset it, turn it back on again, and uh, it should work. The other thing that we absolutely need to make sure that is uh, off is the radar antenna. Uh, this antenna, and I'll put a picture on screen right now, uh, for the APS-82 uh, Hazeltine radar was extremely delicate and was uh, could be easily damaged if subjected to a high G or, or uh, roll maneuvers. So what they would do is they would put it in the stow position during uh, takeoffs, climbs, descents, or uh, you know steep rolls. And anything, uh, if, you, if you take off, land, uh, make a roll uh, higher or greater than 35 degrees left or right, or if you uh, descend at a rate or ascend at a rate greater than 1,500 feet per minute, with this in the rotate position or on, uh, it will break the radar and or the, the antenna and uh, there's a process you need to go through uh, to get it to fixed and we'll talk again about that later but we need to make sure that is off uh, the other thing we can do is back here is the uh, UPM-44C test unit uh, this uh, provides us with uh, information about uh, if our radar is functioning or not uh, which again can be damaged and broken so we'll turn it on now. It does use DC power. However, some of the readouts that are available on this uh, display uh, won't be uh, functional until the aircraft is running. So we're going to get the aircraft fired up, and we'll come back and check on that in a second. All right, so we've got both engines running. Uh, we have both AC generators uh, cut in, and the AC bus tie is also on. So we're going to move back to that test set and look at the uh, oscilloscope here. And we'll see a couple things. First, uh, this first spike denotes our DC power. If you have the AC power off but the DC cut in, uh, you will see a spike here. Uh, this next spike is our AC voltage. If the AC system is on and functioning, you'll see a spike here. And this panel here controls our field of view. Uh, here it's called signal width, but uh, in the game uh, you'll know it is field of view. So by increasing my field of view or signal width, you'll see a spike start to increase and grow here. And if you're attempting to con uh, pick up contacts at the maximum uh, range of this radar uh, array, which is 20 kilometers, uh, I would recommend having the field of view set uh, a little higher. You'll get inaccurate readings, but the chances of uh, picking up a distant and maybe even a small contact will uh, be uh, quite a bit uh, greater. The uh, next thing you'll see here is these three steps. On the real radar, this denoted basic, sin, cost, and mod trigger. Uh, on this system, uh, it, it denotes operation of the radar. Uh, if you see these steps, you know that all the circuitry within the system is functioning properly. And uh, even though the radar may be off, uh, it's functional and will operate. This button here uh, will generate a test signal uh, or a contact. 
if you prefer. By pushing this button, you'll see another step right here. And if the radar is on and functioning, if uh, it picks up a contact briefly, you'll see that same uh, step right there. But what it's doing is it's uh, generating a, a false contact. What it also will do, and I'll show you this later once we're airborne, uh, it'll generate false contacts on the, all the scopes so that uh, we can verify that they are operating uh, correctly. So uh, we'll move up here, and before we take off, one of the last things we may or may not want to do, uh, it depends on your own operating uh, practices, is we want to maybe get the radar fired up, because it does take, uh, in real life it took 15 minutes uh, to, to f warm up. Uh, I have it currently set to 2, uh, with a cooldown of 1 minute. So if you, ac if you turn it on and accidentally turn it off, uh, you have a full minute before it will actually uh, completely cool down. So you can turn it back on without having to w wait that full two minutes. So uh, you can, if you so choose, go into the uh, composite block for this uh, radar, which is located in the radome, and adjust it as you see fit all the way down to zero minutes. Uh, anyway, so this panel right here controls the radar itself. At the top here we have our magnetron current. Uh, this shows currently 1.54, which tells us that we do have AC power going to the system. Uh, when the radar has warmed up, this dial will increase to over three. Uh, so right now we just have, if once I turn this on, uh, it won't show that it's warmed up and working. So uh, down here we have our uh, radar tilt angle. Uh, it doesn't uh, go above zero degrees uh, level with the horizon. It can uh, go down, point down 15 degrees, uh, which isn't really necessary unless there's uh, an aircraft maybe uh, directly underneath you. So uh, you really don't need to uh, play with the, uh, the tilt angle very much, but it is there if you need it, and you can control it with these two buttons here. This button here is our uh, the power switch for the APS uh, Hazeltine radar, uh, and we'll turn that on now. Uh, you'll see the radar antenna fault light come on. That's fine. That just tells us that our antenna is in the stow position. Uh, if it was on otherwise, even if the, if the radar was in the uh, rotate position, that means we, uh, we broke something. Uh, when the system is warmed up completely, again, the magnetron current will increase to over 3. Uh, down here, we have the range scale for our uh, Operator 1 scope, and the Radar 2 operator has the same panel here. Uh, and he can increase or decrease the range of the scope uh, with these two buttons. So I can set it to uh, you know 10 kilometers, and he can stay at 5. These two system uh, scopes are independent of each other. So while our radar is warming up, uh, we can begin uh, taxing uh, and take off, and I'll be back with you uh, once we're airborne at about 5,000 feet. All right, so we're cruising at about 5,000 feet. I've leaned the engines back to 0.77, which is about 700 RPMs. Uh, this is the best setting for these engines from an economical standpoint. Uh, you're just sipping on fuel right now. Uh, you're only making about 125 knots, uh, but for providing AEW for a carrier battle group, uh, this is a pretty good place to be. Uh, as a note to the aircraft's handling and uh, the radar, uh, because the center of mass is much higher on this aircraft than it is on the tracker or trader, uh, when you're making a banking turn, uh, it can be difficult to arrest the roll and recover from that turn. So I would recommend really uh, not making uh, rolling turns any greater than about 35, 45 degrees. Uh, anything around, anything greater than that can be difficult to come out of. Uh, the radar works best when you're above your contact or where you think your contacts may be. While it can pick up uh, aircraft above it, uh, it is less effective than it would be uh, if they were below you. So keep that in mind. Uh, try to have a good idea of where you or fly as high as you can or just know where your enemy is going to be as best you can. Alright, so we're going to go back and get our radar operators finally fired up back here. Alright, we're going to verify that our magnetron current is above 3. It is. That means the system is, the APS-82 is now working. We're going to turn on the height indicator scope for operator 1 and his azimuth range indicator. And we're going to do the same for operator 2. And we're going to verify that our attitude is pretty much level. We're not banking. So I'm going to unstow the radar, and we are now radiating, uh, which means that anybody with a radar detector on the aircraft will now see us. And we are also transmitting uh, two different radio signals. 
uh, which anybody with a uh, sophisticated or semi-sophisticated triangulation system uh, will now know we are here. So keep that in mind. Uh, if you're trying to avoid being seen, yeah, you can put that in the stowed position and uh, you won't be radiating anymore. Last thing we want to do is we want to test our scopes are functioning. So I'm going to uh, press and hold the test signal generator and you're going to see uh, the, uh, several uh, blips start to appear on both scopes and every 2500 meters it's going to be showing uh, a blip 360 degrees and on the height indicators you're going to see spikes on both sides. So this tells us that both our scopes are functioning and uh, we are now operational. So I'm going to release the uh, test signal button and uh, get our radars operational. So I'm going to set our uh, scope range up to 20 kilometers for both of them. And uh, what you now see here is you see this little blip on the uh, height indicator. This denotes uh, sea level. So we know that this system is now functioning. And lo and behold, we have a contact. There it is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my uh, the cursor over that target and I'm going to uh, click with uh, QRE and you're going to see a cursor pop up. Now what it does is you're going to see it's going to show uh, a bearing to our cursor and a range. So I can put that over the target here and uh, well, I'll be around here somewhere. I'm going to lower the field of view a little bit just so we get a bit more accurate uh, reading here. Hopefully that's a little better. I'm going to sit back down. Alright, so we're back. We have a contact here. I'm going to put my cursor over it and uh, what we now know is that from our position, he's at a bearing of 346 and a range of 10 kilometers. And you can see a spike uh, on our uh, height indicator scope here. So what I can now do, coordinating with operator number two, because what happens is when I push this uh, strobe target here, it's going to lock the uh, array onto that target. And uh, that can be frustrating for the, uh, the other individual if he's trying to use the scope as well. So I'm going to press and hold, and it's going to take the uh, radar array and point it directly at the target, and we can now get a uh, an altitude reading to that target. So he's flying at an altitude of roughly 4,000 feet, and at a bearing of 336 from us and 10 kilometers. Now, the next thing we may or may not want to do is actually identify uh, if he's friendly or foe. And this aircraft does come with a uh, IFF uh, detector. Uh, and if they're transmitting, uh, or if they have aboard uh, Penguinos transponder uh, and have it active, they'll be transmitting a, uh, an IFF code, which will be displayed here. If uh, we move the cursor over the contact, and I'm just going to strobe him one more time to make sure I got him. There he is. Good. Uh, I can then press this button, the IFF decode. Hold it for a sec. And we see some numbers pop up here. So what this tells us is uh, that we've got at least three aircraft with a 5200 uh, IFF code, which is good because uh, 5200 is uh, a friendly IFF, of IFF code. And uh, that tells us there's at least three aircraft flying in that, uh, that little area right there. If you have just one or two aircraft, you'll see, of course, just one or two numbers. If you have more than three, uh, the system, uh, the APX-7 only displayed three codes. And uh, Operator 2 has the same uh, ca capacity over here. So if I move my cursor over the target here, I can strobe the target. I can get a uh, altitude. It's now down to about eh, 4,000 feet. I can hit the decode, IFF decode and display those uh, IFF codes there. So we have at least three friendly aircraft uh, operating at... Uh, 315 degrees from us at uh, a, uh, a range of uh, 9 kilometers. And we can track this in, uh, this information and send it on to the fleet. Uh, and that is how the uh, radar operates. And you can, again, uh, if you so choose, uh, change the, uh, the range. We knew he was about 10, so uh, I can change it here. There he is. I'll strobe him again. There he is. We got him on the uh, height indicator. 
It's down to about eh, 3,700. Uh, so a very useful system uh, if you're trying to get fighters to intercept a contact. Uh, you have really all the pertinent information you need so you can do that. And of course you can identify uh, whether or not they're uh, friendly or not. So that's a, that's a handy feature. Uh, next thing we'll go over the uh, system uh, if it fails and uh, what to do in that, uh, that case. Alright, so we're back aboard the carrier safe and sound. Uh, but wouldn't you know it, I forgot to stow the radar antenna. Uh, well, everything seems okay and functioning. But if you see the radar antenna fault light on, and the radar antenna is in the on or rotate position, you've got a problem. So we're going to go back and verify the uh, test set here. And sure enough, you remember those three steps we saw earlier? They're gone. If I press the test signal generator, can't generate a test signal. I can still test the scopes okay, but uh, we probably broke it when we landed. So what I need to do in order to fix it, is I'm going to come over here and I'm going to first thing stow the antenna. I can shut off the screens if I want to. You don't need to have them on. Uh, you can leave them on if you would like. Uh, and I'm going to turn off the power for the uh, APS-82 radar. And then I'm going to go in here and I'm going to shut off the AC uh, bus tie. Uh, and then we're going to have to wait for it to get fixed. And the way we'll know it fixed is we'll see those steps reappear back on the... Uh, oscilloscope here. This is to simulate uh, uh, a maintenance crew having to come aboard and fix the radar. Uh, they would want you to unpower the system before they start fiddling with it. Uh, so you're going to have to wait at least a couple minutes for that to happen. We'll do that now. Alright, so our uh, maintenance guys fixed the radar for us. Thank you very much. You'll see those steps are back on the oscilloscope. Uh, and we can test the display again, and we get that uh, false generation step as well. So we can now go ahead and uh, fire everything back up and get back in the air. Uh, remember, you cannot fix the radar uh, while airborne. Uh, it has to be done on the ground, and the aircraft has to be completely stationary, and uh, the radar and the AC bus tie need to be off. So I hope that helped. Uh, I hope you find this aircraft useful, and... I appreciate uh, you downloading it, and I hope you have a uh, nice day.